Hello, I'm Claire Freeman, Director of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. Welcome to this week's talk, one in a series of NHSN's Winter Nature Talks programme. As a society, we've been sharing talks since the year we were founded in 1829. And in those early years, many people would have been isolated in their pursuit of natural history. So over those 191 years since, we have been bringing people together to hear about the latest discoveries and environmental findings. This year, digital technology, we hope, will enable us to share the talks with many more people to inspire them to care for and protect nature. Please do visit our website to find out more about NHSN. And also, you might like to keep in touch with us for news about Northeast nature. I now hand over to one of my colleagues who will introduce this week's speakers. And I hope you enjoy the talks. Hello and welcome to this week's 1829 talk. Uh, you're very welcome. I am Professor Annie Tindley uh, and it's my honour to be one of the trustees uh, of the Natural History Society of Northumbria and to be introducing these 1829 series of talks to you. Um, the 1829 talks um, highlight and celebrate uh, the year of our foundation uh, as a society, as one of the oldest uh, and most honourable uh, natural history societies uh, in Britain. And the purpose of these talks is to allow a platform and showcase uh, for the most exciting and cutting edge new research being undertaken by our early career researchers. So they're here really to, to share with us the latest findings in environmental research. As such, I hope you enjoy uh, this week's talk um, and I could urge you, if you can, to follow us on social media, uh, Natural History Society uh, of Northumbria, and enjoy the talk. Good evening, everybody. Um, for those of you who are joining and watching these videos, thank you very much. Of course, we would love to be here in person to uh, have these discussions and talks as we did last year. Uh, but it's great to see these initiatives still still up and running and we'll still try and share some of the science that we're doing through the um, Northumberland Natural History Society. So I'm a PhD student in Newcastle University and today I'll talk to you about my PhD research on corals. Um, specifically I'm looking at trade-offs between coral traits, uh, traits like growth or heat tolerance, and I'm going to look at the implications of these trade-offs for natural selection and assisted evolution, uh, two things which will become more and more important uh, under climate change. But first of all, this is a general talk, and I'd like to just um, go a little over what are coral reefs. Um, I'll identify the research gap, which is relating to these trait trade-offs. Um, I'll discuss my methods and some preliminary results. So coral reefs, um, they're beautiful ecosystems. They're ecosystems which are built from coral organisms. Um, similar to the way trees grow in a forest, corals grow forming coral reefs. And they can create entire barrier systems which are even visible from satellites. Um, here the entire light blue area is a, a barrier reef. As we zoom in on this, you can start to see the smaller scale structure of this reef. You have an edge, which is darker brown, and this is actually coral, uh, whereas the inner section, which is a much paler brown, is the sandy area. And as you zoom in even more, you start to see the patterns between these different corals and this hard substrate. Um, this whole ecosystem is made up and is formed by scleractinian corals, habitat forming corals. And in this photo, which is a composite of about 25 different images, you can see all of these different coral colonies um, as these different shapes. Uh, each is an individual colony and there are multiple different species here. But as we zoom in further, we can look at one specific species in this study and in a lot of my PhD work, I'm working on this particular species, the one which is branching and slightly purple, is called 
at Cropper digitifera. But we zoom in even more from these coral colonies, they're made up, they're a colonial organism made up of hundreds or even thousands of individuals. We call each individual a polyp. And you can see this fleshy uh, group of tentacles. This is a single coral individual, part of a larger coral colony. And it is uh, connected by the base, which is the skeleton. Um, as we zoom in even more on one of these coral polyps, you can see this greenish colored material inside the tissue. That's a symbiotic algae called symbiodinium. And these symbiotic algae, they photosynthesize. So there's a symbiosis going on here. You have algae, which are photosynthesizing and producing all of this carbon from CO2. Uh, they're then giving this food source to the corals. And in exchange, the corals are providing nutrients for the algae and also a refuge. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about coral bleaching. Well, coral bleaching is a hugely large scale phenomenon. I mean, you hear of the entire Great Barrier Reef bleaching. However, it's a really small scale, physiological scale process. And coral bleaching is when the symbiosis between the coral host and the symbiont, the symbiodinium, the symbiosis breaks down. And the photosynthesis of the symbiodinium becomes too uh, rampant and actually starts to produce toxic oxygen radicals. And the coral host then expels the algae, uh, leaving no pigment behind because the pigment is within the algae, like chlorophyll, etc. cetera. Um, when corals are bleached, they're still alive. And you can see that within a space of about six months, these corals have bleached. But if they don't get new algae soon, because the algae are the ones who give them food, uh, the corals will die. And coral bleaching events have been happening more and more frequently in recent years. The climate projections show increasing uh, sea surface temperatures and an increasing, uh, increasingly common marine heat waves. Now, heat stress is a major driver of coral bleaching. Um, so Increasing marine heat waves in the coming decades is going to lead to increasing coral bleaching events. But can corals adapt to these warming conditions? There's a lot of debate in the literature. There are some studies uh, which suggest the rates of adaptation that corals need is going to be too slow compared to the rates of warming. However, there's other, other studies which suggest that rapid genetic adaptation could be possible. Um, however, even if adaptation is possible, uh, we can't ignore the fact that the passive approach to ecosystem management, where huge areas of reef, here you can see the Great Barrier Reef, have been gazetted as marine parks, um, you, you can't ignore the fact that this passive approach to ecosystem management doesn't protect against these climate change impacts. A, a marine park can't stop a hugely severe marine heat wave from happening. And throughout the Great Barrier Reef in 2016, in 2017, and in 2020, there has been extensive uh, coral bleaching events. This is causing the entire uh, scientific community, not just within coral reef um, ecology, but also on terrestrial science, terrestrial ecology, to start considering active ecosystem management where the passive approach has failed. Um, and this active ecosystem management could be to reduce alternate stresses like uh, pollution or fishing effort in order to give the most um, resilience of these systems to deal with uh, marine heat waves when they happen. But there's a huge push in these coming years to also look at restoration. Such large areas of ecosystem are now degraded that we must seriously consider restoration efforts. And in Australia, there's a landmark um, program called the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. This program 
um, aims to first test a bunch of different ideas about coral reef restoration and then choose the best ideas and really conduct huge R&D on these uh, methods with the hope to implement at scale some of these restoration efforts in the future. Um, my uh, research group in Newcastle Uni uh, is called the Coral Assist Lab and we are aiming to focus on one of these restoration efforts for coral reefs and it's called assisted evolution. It's essentially selective breeding where you have a natural life cycle of corals where they spawn, uh, the eggs turn to larvae for after, being, after fertilization and attached to the seafloor growing back into adults. The idea of this is to select adult corals which are more heat tolerant in order to end up with a more thermally resistant coral population than if there is no selection for heat tolerant adults. And it's only using the natural uh, variability of traits which are in the population anyway. Um, it's important to also understand complex traits. Uh, heat tolerance is one such complex trait and a lot of things lead to heat tolerance. It's not a simple trait like eye color uh, which is very distinct but heat tolerance can be effect of genetic uh, effects from the corals themselves, environmental effects, Perhaps a coral who has previously experienced a heat wave is less likely to bleach in a forthcoming heat wave. Um, and the effect of symbionts. Some species of these algae, the symbiodinium, some species are more heat tolerant than, other, than others. So depending on the alleles you have, the temperature regime you live in and the symbionts you have, there's a huge range of heat tolerances from highly heat tolerant corals to low heat tolerance corals um, and a huge range in between. We've selected, we've selectively bred for complex traits in many other systems, including agricultural systems, where we select uh, specific cows to uh, produce more milk or to produce more uh, meat. Um, in this case, you have a lot of control of the system. However, selective breeding in corals is in its infancy. So we're really at the beginning stages of a selective breeding idea to test the feasibility of the idea. Um, is it even possible? And would there be deleterious effects if we did select for a certain trait? If you choose for one trait, maybe you lose out on another trait. Uh, there's an example of this with corals, where if you choose, uh, well, corals who are more heat tolerant actually grow slower. So the species of algae, Juristinium, they are more heat tolerant um, and they've tested this in lots of different uh, lab experiments. However, these corals grow slower. The more, corals with the more heat tolerant symbionts grow slower than corals with less heat tolerant symbionts. And this is an example of one of the studies which has shown this, both in the lab and in the field. This can have large ecosystem impacts. And in this case, a coral who's more heat tolerant maybe is more um, likely to survive a marine heat wave, but in all the interim periods uh, between heat wave, just regular years, these corals are growing slower. They're reaching adulthood later, they're producing less eggs. And this study using ecosystem models has actually shown that um, when clade D Symbiodinium is present, um, the percentage coral cover of this model reef declined much faster than if the corals did not have this clady symbiont. So we can look at trade offs with other traits too growth, but also reproductive output, disease resistance, cell repair, and stress tolerance. In this study, we're focusing on growth, fecundity, and heat tolerance. So do trait trade-offs also associate to heat tolerance when all of the corals have the same symbiont? And if so, what are the related ecosystem impacts? And what does this mean for selective breeding efforts? Are there trade-offs between heat tolerance, growth, and fecundity? So I'll now tell you a little bit about my study, our study 
uh, and how we're going about testing this idea. We're focusing on a coral population, a coral reef in Palau in the West Pacific. And in Palau, we're focusing on Acropora digitifera. We've tagged 100 Acropora digitifera corals on the reef. And we aim for each coral colony to measure their heat tolerance, their growth, and their fecundity, and then look for correlations between these three traits. We also need to account for symbiont type to double check that if we detect a trade-off, it's not due to the symbiont type. So I'm going to go through each one of these um, traits and explain how we determine this, uh, this trait. So heat tolerance. We conducted aquarium tank experiments where you take, you go to the reef where we have these adult corals tagged, you take six branches off that coral colony and you bring it back to the aquarium and put it through a, a heat stress trial. In this case, you randomize the nubbins, the coral branches, among all of these heat stress tanks. And it's a long-term heat stress experiment, six weeks long, because marine heat waves in the, in, in, in the field will also be happening on that sort of time scale. And we increase the temperatures incrementally over about two weeks, and we start to then see bleaching responses in the corals. We record these bleaching responses daily. So here you can see the bleaching response between two coral individuals. Um, this is one branch, so the top panel shows through time from left to right throughout the time frame of the experiment this particular coral branch has bleached whereas the lower panel this particular coral, coral branch has not bleached based on these surveys and based on these image analyses we're able to determine for each coral colony on the reef we're able to determine a bleaching mortality index and i won't have time to go into exactly how we measure that but essentially it's a measure from zero to one. We have a measure of BMI. It's confusing because it's not the body mass index, it's the bleaching mortality index. It means heat tolerance, and we have one measure per colony. Uh, colonies could have high heat tolerance or low heat tolerance, and this relates to a low or high BMI. This is the sort of distribution we saw throughout these corals. So a lot of corals in the middle, few highly tolerant corals and few extremely sensitive corals on the right. Now, fecundity, how do we measure the reproductive output? So back to these 100 corals that were tagged on the reef. We go out there, we dive on, the, on these reefs and, and survey these corals. And a week before the corals spawn, we collect two branches, two nubbins per colony. These are taken back to the lab. Uh, they, they have skeleton in them, uh, which is calcium carbonate. So we need to dissolve that calcium carbonate with acid and then store them in ethanol. Then back in Newcastle, I've been dissecting uh, these polyps, 10 polyps per branch. And from these dissections, using a microscope and taking images, we get different metrics of fecundity, of reproductive output. Uh, these are some examples of the eggs within the polyps. Here you're looking at a single polyp and two of the eggs which have been removed from there. And this is an example photo from the microscope. We then have some software to outline all of the eggs, count the number of eggs and measure the size of the eggs. And from this software we have the expected sort of range of diameters which is uh, a good sign. And you can get metrics like the number of eggs per polyp, egg area, the diameter, the volume. We then talk about growth. How do you measure growth of a coral colony? Of course, it's very complicated. A coral colony is a 3D um, object which is growing in many different ways in many different directions. But to create these 3D models year after year after year and then compare the 3D models, you can calculate growth rates. The coral in question is the one with the tag here. 
and we were using Rubik's cubes in the beginning for, uh, for scale. This is an example of a 3D model of a coral colony. And when you compare this uh, coral's 3D model year on year, you end up with this sort of heat map from the coral colony, where the more red areas are the areas growing faster and the green areas are more static through time. So growth in these corals is really an outward growth. We can measure radial extension, surface area growth, volumetric growth. The next thing is to take these three traits, growth, fecundity, heat tolerance, and look for trade-offs. So this is the first of the preliminary results. And we see this relationship between heat tolerance on the x-axis from highly tolerant to very sensitive corals and the number of eggs per polyp for that colony. Um, there's no significant trend here, meaning this line for all intents and purposes is no different statistically than a completely flat horizontal line. However, there is slightly more um, eggs per polyp for the more heat tolerant corals, which is interesting. We've only been able to look at results for some of the corals, uh, so sorry, we're now looking at the growth heat tolerance trade-off. In this case, again, the x-axis, you have highly tolerant and sensitive corals on the right. Growth is increasing as you go up and the more heat tolerant corals in general have more um, growth also. This is a similar trend to fecundity and this is in terms of volume and surface area. But I'd like to just mention, this was only based on 13 coral colonies, so we really need to get more here. And um, what do these relationships really mean? So are there trade-offs between growth, heat tolerance, and fecundity? We haven't detected any significant trade-offs yet, um, but we do need to build more of these 3D models uh, to get more uh, measurements of growth. I think we have a maximum of about 60, but we only have 13 done so far. But it doesn't look like there's huge trade-offs as of the preliminary analysis. If there are no likely trade-offs, then there's not likely to be a negative effect of selecting for heat tolerance. Now, if you had a selective breeding program, where you choose heat tolerant adult colonies to breed, we're saying there's not likely to be a hugely negative effect of selecting those colonies. Um, and this also stands for natural selection. If a heat wave wipes out all of the sensitive corals and you're just left with the heat tolerant ones, we're not expecting to have huge declines in uh, growth. But one warning here, there's a lot of environmental stochasticity in this whole system. There's a lot of other things happening on the reef. There's grazing from fish, there's uh, rainfall, you have storm damage. So there's a lot of other things happening which may mask these trends. And it is possible that trade-offs do exist. Um, we haven't found evid evidence of, but that isn't evidence that the trade-off doesn't exist. So to wrap all of this up, what does this really mean? The trade-off theory, it's been developed mainly um, on corals and their symbionts. You have this one symbiont, which is more heat tolerant, but it causes the coral to grow less. However, those studies are on a few species of coral and from certain locations. So are these trends also seen in other systems, in other species? Um, and are these trade-offs also seen when you only have one um, coral symbiont among the population? Well, we're hoping to get an answer to that here. It doesn't look like that trade-off exists. We found evidence for strong corals and weak corals. The more heat tolerant corals, they also grew slightly, slightly faster and maybe produced slightly more eggs. Um, whereas the very sensitive corals in terms of heat tolerance, they were growing slightly slower and producing less eggs. But again, these trends are preliminary analyses and we can't say that conclusively. 
are there immunolo in, immunological drivers to this? Potentially. Um, corals in, in general, bleaching and disease resistance and other impacts that you find on corals have also correlated to immunological drivers. Um, and this could be also the reason that you have these particularly weak corals. They have a poor immune system, potentially, and they're just weaker to all types of stress. And what are the effects on selective for heat tolerant corals in a selective breeding program, like an assisted evolution um, restorative effort? From our study, we haven't found that there would be any hugely um, damaging trade-offs. I'd like to give a huge thanks to NHSN, to my supervisors here in Newcastle Uni, Northumbria Uni and University of Queensland, and also to the collaborators who've been working uh, on the 3D models. Um, this is a group of researchers from University of Sydney, and of course my fund is One Planet no, and Coral Assist. Thanks all very much. I would love to take questions, but unfortunately this format is not the, uh, not the best for that type of thing. Anyway, thanks very much. Good evening.